So, very good. So the question was, um, it, if somebody had a low blood pressure and then um, had a SCAD, if I'm correct, and then was diagnosed with a high blood pressure, do we think the cause of it is related to the SCAD or is it the SCAD that causes it? So from my experience, uh, and Dave I'm sure has a lot to add, is that what so the most important question for us is, has this patient been running a bl high blood pressure as a result of something else, for example, uh, fibromuscular dysplasia or a dissection in a renal artery, or have they become hypertensive, which has predisposed them to have a spontaneous coronary artery dissection, dissection on a background of genetic susceptibility. And that's why, from, from our perspective, is that we screen patients to look for one, have you got true diagnosis of hypertension, so the ambulatory blood pressure monitor, which gives us a, a good indication. And two, we do look for fibromuscular dysplasia uh, in the renal arteries in particular to see if, if that's something that has not been diagnosed or it's an association that could, have been, could be the reason for the new hypertension that wasn't previously there. As I said, most patients who have FMD in the renal arteries don't have high blood pressure. So it's difficult to ascertain at what point they will develop high, high blood pressure or may, they may never do so. And that's why we keep a very close eye on those two factors. I don't know if David's got anything else to add. The other key question is, if we take a population of patients who've had SCAD and look at the arteries, then it is not that uncommon. In fact, it is very common to find stuff. Now that stuff might be a bit of irregularity here. It might be a bit of additional tortuosity. It might be that the arteries are a bit curlier than normal. Or, the, if you like, the other end of the spectrum are the sorts of pictures that Abby's been showing you with the string of beads, the classical fibromuscular dysplasia. When we hear the, the, that some studies report a prevalence of fibromuscular dysplasia of 86%, the question, or part of the question, is how important are those things that they're reporting? Are they reporting the string of beads, the fibromuscular dysplasia, the tight narrowings, the typical pictures? Or are they actually reporting extra tortuosity, bits of narrowing or irregularity here and there? And of those patients that they are reporting, what proportion of those patients actually have fibromuscular dysplasia, which is of importance to them as a patient? that is actually going to develop, go on to develop a problem. And we know that those problems do sometimes happen, but it, our experience is that the problems arising are unusual. So we need to sort of make sure that it's clear that there's a bit of a mismatch between what the arteries look like in terms of being able to find things which you say, well, that doesn't look quite the same as what I would expect to be absolutely normal, and patients who have fibromuscular dysplasia that actually is important in terms of potentially needing action or follow-up. Now, fibromuscular dysplasia lives a little bit in the same world as SCAD in that it's a condition that's been neglected over a long period of time and we're now trying to gather together to internationally, if you like, to try and understand a bit more about it. Again, in the UK, Abby's setting up a, cl a clinic in London. We're going to be starting to see patients with fibromuscular dysplasia in Leicester, so we hope to be able to start to provide more of a, a service. And also, again, matching with what we've been doing in SCAD, there is an uh, international position paper which is at the publication stage on fibromuscular dysplasia now. So that's going to just do the same thing. It's going to set the groundwork. But one of the key things in fibromuscular dysplasia, which is still not absolutely certain, is you know, what happens over time. Certainly, the suggestion is, is, again, that the majority of these cases don't change a great deal. But there do seem to be a, a small number that do progress and, and develop issues. So in the SCAD population, the key questions are what you know, what proportion of scanned patients have fibromuscular dysplasia that's ever going to be important to them? I think it will be a small number. So there'll be lots more people that will have something that you can see in the arteries, but those that for which it actually is important will be a small number, okay? And I, I think I've digressed from your question, but anyway. Um, I, I think the main point from your question is that I don't know, I certainly... I'm not sure that I have yet seen 
somebody with SCAD and fibromuscular dysplasia who has developed high blood pressure as a direct consequence of their uh, renal fibromuscular dysplasia. I suspect eventually I will see such a patient, but it certainly isn't all of the SCAD people that I'm seeing. It is much more likely if you develop high blood pressure that it is the standard, what we call essential, the same high blood pressure that everybody else in the population has, than it's related to the fibromuscular dysplasia. But because we know about the coincidence, we should be thinking about that, which is what Abby was saying. Sorry for the rambling, but hopefully it answered the question. Um, so he, am I correct by hearing, is there any evidence of weight gain? Um, so I think both Dave and I, have, um, so I think one of the commonest things to go about weight gain, weight gain is one of those things that commonly happens just partly because if you're sedentary, you're not exercising and you've gone from being a super athlete or somebody who's quite fit in any condition, whether you have a chest infection or you become unwell and you stop exercising, you're very likely to unfortunately gain weight. I think what my experience has been as well on top of that is that unfortunately patients after they have SCAD there is a period of time where they are sedentary, they struggle to get back to normal because they are scared or they've got symptoms and that's all reasonable. But also on top of it is that a lot of patients are put on loads of medications on discharge and certainly that has an impact on your metabolic rate, how your body processes food, your energy levels, and what you can and cannot do in terms of exercise. And so I think it's a multifactorial thing. I don't think it's SCAD related, but I think it's a consequence of somebody becoming unwell, ending up on drugs, or even if not ending up on drugs, taking a while for them to heal and mend. And obviously getting back to normality will take time. So we do see, and I, you know, I think as a woman, I completely understand. Um, I see a lot of women who come to my clinic and they're frustrated by this because they just want to get back to shape. They want to run around uh, and be physically active. And I think this is part of what hopefully we can offer is be able to tailor your medication and also give you the confidence to get back out there and to be able to exercise safely, eat well, and also be mentally well as a result of all of that. Speaking for the uh, older ladies in the group, I wondered if anything was being done to work out why, why we had to wait until maybe our late 60s before something happened. You know, it's way past menopause, certainly not peri or postpartum. So what, <laughs> is that being looked into at all? So, it is an interesting question, and I think that, you know, again, part of what Alice was talking about earlier is that we're, we are interested in trying to start to understand these questions. It may be, I'm going to speculate wildly now, but it may be that it is to do with oestrogen exposure over the course of time, and maybe peaks and troughs, who knows? But you know, we don't understand these things at the moment. As of this moment in time, we are not specifically planning to study that postmenopausal group, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not interested in that population. So we will continue to, I mean, at the moment we're analysing lots and lots of data. And I guess what Alice is doing is picking very specific groups to look at. That's not to say we won't come back to that area, and definitely we're very interested in it. Um, but I think we have to sort of be a bit selective, otherwise we don't manage to get to the, the, the hub of it. And I think what I would say is that sometimes some of the rationale behind which groups we study is because we think that maybe in that group, the mechanistic questions that we're asking will be a little bit easier to identify. So for example, if you take the recurrent population of patients who have had, had more than one problem, or maybe the population of patients who have SCAD and FMD, that population of patients, or maybe the men, may just be because they're that little bit different, they might be able to give us an answer that actually applies across the population. Okay? Whereas some, some other populations may be a little bit more heterogeneous, may have a number of other things that influence that population and maybe uh, are not such an easy population to go at to try and get the answers. Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get answers or at least hints from 
a smaller group as we can, because at the moment we don't have a resource to go out to the whole 500 of you and say, let's all get everybody scanned at Leicester. We can't do that. So we have to be selective and try to learn from those groups. Sir? Of the people who have had an MI following the SCAD, um, is there any correlation of which were end STEMI and which were STEMIs? On the initial um, ECG following the admission? So from memory, it's about 10 or 15 percent STEMI. Uh, most of them are in STEMI. So for those of you who are not familiar with these terms, STEMI, it's about the ECG diagnosis. STEMI is where you get a, a, a particular pattern on the ECG which often associates with a completely blocked vessel or a very, very severely blocked vessel. Whereas the end STEMIs are the ones that you usually diagnose either with more subtle changes on the ECG or with blood markers, if you like. So the, the answer is, is that they are, there is a much higher proportion in the end STEMI group. Uh, STEMIs are much smaller, and there are a small number of, of, of cases that present with sudden arrhythmia, um, sudden heart arrhythmia problems, tragically. So the first thing to say is that we don't have all of the answers, okay? There are lots of potential answers to questions. There are lots of things which might help with something like post-SCAD chest pain. And there are things that one person will find to be helpful, and maybe a small group will find to be helpful, but not necessarily helpful for everybody. In terms of the specific question about iron supplementation, um, iron deficiency anemia is common in a young female population, uh, and particularly common in a young female population on antiplatelet drugs, which <laughs> can cause problems with excessive bleeding and lead to anemia. So I think there's certainly a lot of sense in saying that if you have anemia and you are iron deficient, that correction of uh, anemia and iron deficiency is sensible. <coughs> I think going beyond that to say that this is a, uh, a therapy which has a particular effect at this time would be speculative. It's not something that I've necessarily consistently seen in people that I've uh, uh, seen in the clinic. That doesn't mean that it doesn't, you know, it, it hasn't benefited some people. Uh, but, you know, what we have to try to do with the research side of things is to be systematic and to say, well, rather than, you know, we're, we're certainly interested in hearing all of these things because it helps us develop hypotheses and ideas that we then might want to look at. But we have to also be careful about, if you like, going down one particular channel based on, if you like, a, a, a sort of a, a, a small group that have an anecdote that it, it helps in that situation when there may be other things that, that, that also do that. So what I'm interested in doing is trying to build the evidence base. So trying to say, okay, iron is an interesting idea. It has lots of different effects in terms of what it does to your body, not just on the blood system elsewhere as well. Is that something that we can look at and how would we approach looking at it? So I think that specific thing is interesting, but I, I certainly at the moment wouldn't say uh, that we would advocate it as a treatment beyond uh, the um, uh, treatment of iron deficiency anemia where it is present. Yeah, I think clinically exactly that. I think um, 
I, I, I've inherited women, non-SCAD women who have had iron deficiency in clinic. Um, and I can tell you from experience that they get chest pain, uh, whether it's the same type or not is difficult to establish, but certainly those who are anemic and helping them get back to their baseline, it seems to help their symptoms. So it's more of the fact that we're treating um, a condition of anemia rather than whether it makes a difference. But if anyone felt anemic and had low iron, they'll feel dreadful because they just won't have enough energy. So it's trying to boost that for them, I think. Start with that one. I don't mind. Um, so that's a very difficult situation to be in because um, in, in most cases we tend to not want to interfere in it. If we, so we'd have to be convinced that the fibromuscular dysplasia itself in the renal artery is totally responsible for the high blood pressure rather than the high blood pressure is kind of in association with fibromuscular dysplasia. And that's very difficult. So from my experience of this, most of our patients will have ultrasounds of their kidneys. We'll look at the flow of the artery, um, the flow to the ar uh, through the artery. We'd look at the kidney size. If there was compromise, then obviously that's something we would discuss at a vascular level to decide whether we, there is some sort of other endovascular intervention we would opt for. However, unfortunately, in most cases that I've come across, those sort of interventions do have high associations for complications. And it's very rare for us to find, I mean, the ones that I have personally seen, where we do the Dopplers uh, and we know that there is fibromuscular dysplasia, there doesn't seem to be compromise in blood flow to the kidney and the kidney size is normal. So that, therefore, we aim to kind of get the medical treatment right. There has been some theory, and this is just a uh, kind of theory in terms of management of hypertension. There was something called um, sympathectomy where they could um, treat the nerve that supplies the kidney. However, the data from that is very poor, and therefore there is not much evidence that it makes a long-term outcome to these patients. So the mainstay, unfortunately, does remain to be treatment because the hypertensive is condition is not thought to be just due to fibromuscular dysplasia, it's due to a bigger, broader spectrum condition of hypertension. And so obviously we have to exclude other causes other than fibromuscular dysplasia. There's quite a, a specific and specialist question in some respects that, and it's probably you know, a, a good one for an individual answer rather than a general answer. I think the general answer is that most hypertension does respond to drug treatment and it's simply a question of getting the right combination of drugs in order to be able to control it without getting um, problematic side effects. So usually that is the response and actually even in the fibromuscular dysplasia literature there is some discussion about whether vascular intervention adds a massive amount to good drug treatment for hypertension in the context of renal fibromuscular dysplasia. So I think, you know, there, there are always individuals and individual circumstances that need to be thought about uh, specifically, but I think the general thing is that control of blood pressure, high blood pressure is important, and it's usually is, uh, can be achieved with uh, drug treatments, and it's a question really of getting that right. Um, so I'm very keen to answer that question, which is that um, I think universally across everybody who treats SCAD, we are aware of this and we do not think it is a problem. It is not a problem to pick up your child. It is not a problem to push your push chair. You know, I think what you have to remember, and we always have to be careful in SCAD, because what happens is an association is made and then because of that association, 
it suddenly becomes a generalization all of a sudden. So it suddenly gets applied to everybody just because a small... So what this arises from is that there are a small number of cases of SCAD, predominantly in males, uh, who are weightlifting, right? So they lift the weight and they go, oh, I've got chest pain. That is, a, that is a small population of patients, right? What, what we're then doing is generalizing that to predominantly female population picking up their kids. <laughs> and it, it's not the same thing. So I think, you know, when we, 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 we had a sit-down meeting in Stanford with um, Sharon Hayes, Jackie Saw, all of the big SCAD players internationally, all the people who look after a lot of SCAD patients. And we specifically said, I can't believe that some people would advise patients to lift weights such that they could not pick up their own child. That specific scenario was discussed and refuted. Okay, so nobody out there thinks that that's not a perfectly acceptable and reasonable thing to do. What, we're, you know, what we came down on as a consensus in that group, because what we were trying to do is reach a group decision as to what was right, and the consensus was basically don't go crazy so you know maybe don't jump out of an airplane you know maybe don't do the sort of 10g thing at alton towers you know those kind of things things where you'd think to yourself you know at least i'd think to myself my i'm not going to do that then just don't <laughs> do it you know but other stuff is fine When it comes to driving, the DEBLA isn't very clear. Uh, we get different, we've had it on the Facebook forum as well. People who have other types of heart attacks give me different advice. Uh, basically, 30 days you should be safe to drive. But it also mentions unstable angina. If you have unstable angina, you shouldn't drive. Now, some of us are said we get chest pain for months after our SCAD. Would you class the SCADs as unstable angina? Or is it more likely to be? Um, do you want? I, 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 I feel like I'm. I'm not. I thought it, okay, I'll do it. That's fine. Um, so, um, I think driving advice in general is com is about common sense. So, if you have symptoms which come on suddenly and are debilitating, such that you are not safe when you are driving a vehicle, then it is logical to say that it is not safe for you to drive. I think that. You know, that it, it's, it's almost, for me, more common sense than DVLA guidance. So, for me, I think the standard myocardial infarction guidelines are perfectly acceptable. So, it's okay to drive after a month. If you get chest pain, again, we know that, you, that there's chest pain after SCAD. I certainly wouldn't describe that as being unstable angina. I think it's post-SCAD chest pain. And then I think it's about common sense. So if that, the nature of that post scan chest pain means that it comes on suddenly and unpredictably, and when it comes on, you are not in a safe position to you know, con continue to take your car to a safe place or whatever it is you would need to do, then it makes sense to say, think about whether that's, you know, it's, it's, it's more that common sense bit for me. I think for the overwhelming majority of people who do get post scan chest pain, it is not of that debilitating nature. So you might get it, you might feel that you need to pull over and stop and take a bit of a pause, whatever helps you, a bit of a GTN or just a rest or whatever helps you to, to, to get to a resolution, but that it's not such that actually, you know, you're not safe to drive. So I would stick to the standard DVLA guidance for post heart attacks and beyond that, I'm fairly comfortable with driving, you know, as long as, you know, you're comfortable from a common sense perspective. Yes. Um, when you count FND, you say about surveillance, about regular surveillance, and you talk about regular scans. And I got a new but I'll have a young person on the ground for five minutes as well. Um, but if you're not likely to find anything, like aggressive, are there any risks from regular scans, kind of radiation? Like, like in 2018, you say, well, we've never found anything, we've never got um, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, part of what we don't actually know is the history of what happens with FMD patients that we're finding at the moment. 
Um, and that's the difficult part is we don't know in who will progress and we don't know in whom it may not progress. I suspect from what we have already found that in far the majority there is no progression of this condition. So in terms of surveillance and how often you should do it, so as I said, C2 is fantastic and I think is, at the beginning is probably a very good way, but I think different types of MR imaging and looking at the vessels using different sequences can work. So I think in terms of um, the benefits, I, I think you're, you're, you're kind of pointing towards radiation doses, is that correct? Yeah. So I think there is different ways to adopt it. So what we, te what we can do is use very formulated MR scans to look at specific areas. Uh, we've adopted one at the moment at the Brompton that we're going to put to trial, which basically will mean the scan time is longer, but it will give us as good details as a CT. Um, I think having a one-off CT, which gives you a very small amount of radiation, um, within a year or two does not impact the kind of the risks for cancer unless there is a history to suggest that as well. And I think we're managing, to be honest, in most cases, the biggest amount of radiation you get is the head and neck when you're doing CT, okay? So actually, if you did a CT from the aorta down here, the radiation dose is very small compared to the head and neck. And what we have tried to work with is kind of doing the scanning of the head and neck using MRI because the data seems to be good enough if you use the right sequences and then using CT for later on. But as we will get better at this, I think we will be, be able to put protocols out everywhere for everybody to share, to have more imaging with MRI rather than CT. But this is why we're doing this study, to be able to kind of inform others and ourselves which modality is best for screening. So um, I will do some chuntering on Abby's data and where we're at with that a little bit later from the perspective of the acute scan. So we do hope to be able to answer the question about CT versus MRI for the first scan question. Then there's the separate question about surveillance, which is essentially the question that you, you, you have. And I think that there are a couple of questions. First of all, there's the question about progression and to some extent, that's a bit of a research question. Does this progress or does it stay the same? If it does progress, what proportion of people does it progress in? And can we predict who's progressing and who's not progressing? So there's a whole bunch of research questions. But whenever I am doing a scan, particularly whenever I'm doing a scan that involves x-rays, the thing that's going through my head is, if I find something, am I going to change your management? or not. So, if I do a scan and I follow up and I go, oh look, there's a little bit of change in the way that your renal fibromuscular dysplasia looks. If you have no high blood pressure, I am not going to change anything that I do. Even if you do have high blood pressure, I'm probably going to put you on the same tablets that I would have put you on without being able to see those pictures. Okay? So, that's what, what's going through my mind, certainly before thinking about doing further testing that involves x-ray. So I think the first scan is important because we need to know what's there. At the moment, it's not clear whether we need to be sort of doing further screening tests over time because a proportion of people progress, so that's unknown. And it's actually not that well known in the fibromuscular dysplasia population, let alone the SCAD FMD population. But I think we have to always remember when we're doing any imaging with x-rays about whether it's going to change what we do. Because finding stuff is fine, but you know, if, if I was to take you all now and take you off for a CT and let's say I found a little dissection somewhere, if the management of that dissection is leave it alone, which is what it's going to be most of the time, and you've got no symptoms, I haven't changed anything about your treatment. And so, even though I know something, it's not changed anything. So did I need to do the scan in the first place? So there are, there are quite a few questions in this area that are unanswered. I think we should move forward with the research to try to address those. And I'll talk later a little bit about how far on we are with that. Um, and you know, hopefully, we'll be able to then firm up on things. But at this time, I think it's unclear as to whether surveillance is merited and if surveillance is merited by what means. Okay. Oh, one more. Just following on from that, mainly research, 
I mean, you talked about the reason why me and um, how can we avoid it and so on. In the search, Dr. Alice, are, you know, are you looking at how can we prevent it in the future? Is it something I've been doing, like exercise and so on, or is it diet or whatever? You know, and how big a team does it need to be to actually come to a timeline where it's saying, aha, we've now got this. Because I accept that you're going through this research and so on, but is it a, you know, is it a two year, five year, ten year, or perhaps we never will know? But it'll be a small group that will just be on the sideline saying, well, you'll scan. So I think knowledge builds and accumulates over time. And it's knowledge across a spectrum of things. So there's knowledge about, if you like, what it is, what is this disease process? What is the, you know, what are the risk factors? Because of course, if you find risk factors and you start to understand those, then you may be able to modify those risk factors. So for example, we said a little bit earlier that there's a small bit of evidence to suggest that you don't want your blood pressure to get too high on a regular basis if you've had SCAD. So that's a little bit more information that actually directly affects treatment. I think we are also learning, and I'll go through a pile more data later for about three hours, um, <laughs> about these questions that we've just been discussing about what imaging, when imaging, and how much surveillance should we follow. Those are things that will directly affect how we care for patients. And then there's the, uh, if you like, the discovery aspects. So Anya, who waved earlier on, is over there, is doing a lot of the discovery work. That's looking at the genetics of SCAD. Can we identify, it doesn't mean that there is a gene, but of the genes that we start to identify, how do they help us understand the condition? And potentially, how do they help us understand how to mod moderate or change or re reduce the risk of the condition? And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff, not just the genes, other, we call them omics, more just looking at the proteins in the blood, that kind of thing, which I'll, again, I'll, I'll allude to a little bit later which will give us those signals. It can take some time. It can take some time, particularly if we're trying to get a golden bullet that's specific. So new drug X treats SCAD is a long way off because you have to find out what the target is, develop a drug for that target, and then trial it. That's a long thing to think about. But there might be easier wins than we think treating blood pressure, already plenty of treatments for that. We've already said that there's a female sex predominance. There's a heck of a lot of drugs out there that uh, modify female sex hormones in one way or another. They're called contraceptives or HRT or, you know, all of those things can modulate the hormonal processes in women. There's lots of those types of things. So it may actually be we don't understand it well enough at the moment to be able to say, look, this is what we should do. But it may be that there are things out there which can modulate this disease process, which don't require us to invent the, you know, a whole new drug out here that's for SCAD. But actually, maybe we already have something that might be effective, but we don't actually yet understand the disease well enough to be able to come up with that hypothesis suggest that treatment and start to trial it in patients. So that's why we have to sort of build the knowledge pyramid because that's how we get to that moment where we can go, okay, now we're going to do a clinical trial. Would you have any concerns around diabetes as a risk factor? For SCAD. So interestingly, it seems to be in the opposite direction, if anything. So. Uh, the prevalence of diabetes in the SCAD series that are published and in our uh, series appears to be lower than the pop population prevalence, a little bit lower. Uh, why that is difficult to say, it may just be a sort of a chance observation in a way, but certainly it doesn't seem to be that diabetes per se is a risk factor. It's either neutral or it may even be slightly in the other direction. <laughs> It was mentioned to me that um, just to be, to be mindful of it because it can have an impact on the arteries and people already had a dissection that... Yes, I think 
diabetes tends to affect the arteries in terms of more of an atherosclerotic risk. So it's slightly different. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, there's just this hint that uh, diabetes, you know, potentially if it does anything to the blood vessels, it may even be tiny bit protective rather than... Uh, so, yes, it is something that causes arterial diseases, but I don't think uh, it causes this arterial disease in particular, yeah. Is there any advice for migraine sufferers? Because um, I understand we can't take triptans, and that's my go-to drug, so... <laughs> uh, do you want to have a crack at that? <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's very controversial what drugs you should and you can and cannot use with migraines. Um, I think if you have been on a long term, so obviously the mainstay of migraine management is always analgesia, and then there is the the pisotifens, and then there is the triptans and the topamirates, basically. Um, I, in my practice, I kind of do change to different classes to see if I can achieve symptom relief for the patients. Um, I have found pain patients on prophylactic beta blockers. I know you all hate beta blockers, but propanolol is a non-selective -sele non selective beta blocker. It doesn't seem to have that many side effects when taken for migraines. That seems to do the trick. I think if somebody's been on a long-term triptan and it's managed their symptoms, I think we would with caution kind of say well we'll take it maybe reduce the dose and see how we go but i probably wouldn't start a trip tan in somebody who has never been on a trip tan because of just the association with it basically um so that's why i would say there are other alternatives so it depends also on how bad your migraines are so believe it or not botox actually is a treatment for migraines uh, it's actually licensed on the nhs i wouldn't say you should run to your gps for it immediately but there are other alternatives as well that can be considered. It's probably equally difficult to answer, but what about HRT and oral contraceptives? I know that. So, exogenous hormonal treatments, oral contraceptives and HRT, get a bad press in SCAD. So, why is that? Well, essentially, it's because we know that SCAD is a disease of women and in some cases a disease of the peripartum, so around the time of pregnancy. And therefore, as a logical extension of that, it does seem that female sex hormones have some role in the pathophysiology. What we don't know is what that role is. And as we were talking about this in a little bit of a question earlier on about treatments and whether actually female sex hormones in some form might have a therapeutic benefit. And the problem here is that we don't know what part of the female sex hormones or their cycling is bad, and indeed what part of it is good. So the basis of the anxiety is simply that association. People have also written up the fact that there are cases of SCAD and people that take oral contraceptives. Well, how surprising is that? You know, if you look in this population, you're going to see lots of people that are taking hormonal contraceptives. So, again, I, I don't think that there is very clear, definitive evidence at present that contraceptives or HRT per se definitely increase the risk of recurrence, which is essentially the question that we're asking here. So, um, we're sort of left in this slight limbo. We think female sex hormones have a role, but we don't know exactly how they cause that or contribute to that role. Contraception and HRT uh, can be very important therapies, obviously. And we have to try and, but we also have to try and balance that off against the fact that, you know, there is this involvement. Personally, I am relatively relaxed about these things because I don't think that there's a very clear link between the two. What we tend to do is, rather as Abby's just alluded to with the migraine treatment, is to sort of work our way up to that point in steps. So maybe we don't start with an oral contraceptive pill. We might think about other forms of contraception, whether they are practical, uh, 
if we do go down the line of contraception, maybe we go for a low-dose progesterone-type strategy rather than a combined pill, those kind of things. It, it, it's not necessarily based on a, on a whole lot of data. It's that kind of hunch of saying, well, we'll try to minimise that a bit if we can. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's an area of uncertainty. But I think we also have to remember ob you know, the obvious thing, which is that you know, in terms of risks, you know, unplanned pregnancy is probably a, a significantly higher risk than whatever hormonal contraception you take. So uh, it's a slightly vague answer, but I think it's, 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 a, it's a question of clearly contraception is, you know, is required. Perhaps start at the bottom rung of that ladder, but if you, you know, ultimately if you require an oral contraceptive pill and that's the alternative that works, I don't think that there is strong evidence to say that that is a, you know, that is a very high risk strategy. Do you have a thoughts on that? No, I think I'm exactly along the same lines. I think, um, if, yeah. So I think I, I completely agree and take the sentiment that. You know, they, they don't, I don't think there is any evidence to show they increase your risk of a SCAD reoccurrence or a SCAD occurrence. Um, and I think we, we always start off with a Mirena or a, an implant before we'd go to an oral if it's possible. Um, but I think it, every patient is to their own and they may have their own preferences. So I think we have to work along what works for patients as well. So I think we're sort of cautiously pragmatic, if that's... Yeah? No? Yeah? Is the risk of a real tolerance higher in those of us that have had sort of uh, cardiac arrests, uh, ST elevations, stents, uh, as opposed to the medically man managed? Yeah. So um, there's not a massive amount of data on this at the moment, uh, excepting the single Canadian study that I've referred to a couple of times, which has looked at cases prospectively. They haven't necessarily specifically looked at those things which you've just said. They looked at some medications in terms of the increased risk. We also did look at the gene, the factor one gene that I mentioned earlier, and that didn't seem to partition with, with a risk, particular risk of recurrence. So at the moment, I don't think we yet have uh, clarity on any specific risk factors for recurrence beyond possibly high blood pressure that's not adequately treated. That's the only thing that's, you know, that we can base on data, and that data <coughs> is from the single study and is observational, as I said before. So it's data that's there, but should be treated, if you like, with some caution. Um, do other arteries, other than coronary arteries, have this same... So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, dissection of other vessels is recognised, particularly in fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, so carotid dissection, again, is a well-recognised uh, disease entity. And, uh, you know, importantly, we try to work very closely with these other disease specialties. <coughs> so at the moment, we are trying to form, it's called a COST initiative, I think, COST, something like that, another four-letter acronym from Europe. Um, so it's a grouping of the fibromuscular dysplasia <coughs> group, the carotid dissection group, and the SCAD group are trying to form a sort of unified grouping so that we make sure that we're cross-informing each other about what we're doing in research and trying to learn from each other. So you can get dissections in the carotids, in the iliacs, even very occasionally in the arteries that supply the yeah, you know, the, 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 the tummy and the, uh, the digestive organs, they can all be affected by dissections. Those other things are pretty rare. Carotid dissection, again, it's, it's unusual, but it is recognised as a cause of stroke in young people. And as I alluded to earlier, there's some overlap, okay? But it's, you know, it's, it's overlap, I think, rather than everybody's got the same thing. So is it that there's more happening in coronary? Or that the impact of such uh, dissection is uh, greater? 
It's probably a bit of both, I suspect. So uh, I think, you know, you don't, certainly don't hear very often of dissections in the arteries in the legs or, you know, that kind of thing causing problems. Clearly dissections in the, uh, in the cervical and intracranial arteries that cause stroke is something that is, is a, an acute presentation and the coronaries are, are an acute presentation. So, it, it, you know, it probably is, is a bit of that, but also perhaps that these things are not that common. You know, it's not, uh, it, you know, it's not a vanishingly rare disease. You're filling a lecture theatre, but equally it's, you know, it's not common, common either. So the, another question from the, the group, um, talking about circulation and uh, sort of not just heart, um, Reynolds um, condition, Arkenbach syndrome, people are getting diagnosed with that as well, wondering if there's anything that gets seen, SCAD plus these conditions, Lots of people talking about feeling numbness in particularly lower arms, it seems to be. Um, whether that is a result of possible anxiety, which people rightly experience after SCAD, or whether it's a condition in its own right. Is there any understanding of circulatory matters outside of heart problems? Um, it's a, a general hodgepodge of questions that get raised on the group, but they get raised so regularly. Mm -hmm. Would be uh, probably a really impossible thing to ask, but if you've got any thoughts on it, it would be appreciated. Um, so, I think conditions like Raynaud's um, are very common in the general population, so I don't think you could say SCAD and Raynaud's are equal to, one each, to each other. So certainly, Raynaud's affects about 30% of the female population, is commoner in women, just like migraines are commoner in women, um, and you know, they and women with SCAD also have both of these conditions. So I think, that, you know, and they both vascular conditions. So these are common conditions that we see. Um, in terms of numbness in the hands and so on, um, I think that's something that, yes, definitely could be driven by anxiety, but also just kind of elaborating on that, we <coughs> know that when we did some of the ultrasound study, we know that the way the arteries in the arm relax after we let the cuff go down was slightly different to a normal population. I do wonder if, if the flow, the way the blood flows in the arm is altered because of certain mechanics, that whether that can contribute to this numbness uh, in the arm, but that's just me postulating from some, a small collection of data that we've done. Uh, we know that fibromuscular dysplasia, though it's unlikely to cause symptoms, it can affect any artery. Um, we clearly haven't seen it in the arms because we've not looked that far for, into it. But certainly, people who it's documented that people who do have fibromuscular dysplasia affecting downstream, they do have these altered sensation, and that's just case reports that's been reported. So I think it's a big spectrum of things. A lot of it is probably all normality and just common conditions that people coincidentally have, rather than anything specific. Thank you. Please. Um, there's a bit of a standing joke on the um, discussed on the Facebook. Um, about memory and memory loss. <laughs> and a bit of a joke, but yeah, about that. Um, so I'm, not, I'm on, now only on aspirin, for instance, since about September last year, but my memory is still a lot poorer than it used to be pre-SCAD. Have you got anything, any comments about that? What, what was your question? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was there for the taking. Um, yes, I mean, I think that what that is probably reflecting, and we've had a number of conversations with different people today, particularly people early after their SCAD events, who've said, you know, I guess I don't feel quite right, I feel a bit more tired, I can't exercise the same way as I could, maybe I've got a bit of indigestion or something, you know, lots of different <laughs> things that people experience. So the fact that you might find that you can't exercise as much as you could before or there's I issues with other parts of your body. It, it doesn't surprise me greatly that the thing that's above the neck that we think is immune from what happens below the neck also gets uh, affected to some extent. You know, it's probably a combination of being significantly unwell, having a whole bunch of medications, having a heart that's been poorly and getting better again, that add together to give that effect, it probably also has some impact of uh, many of the things that Sally was referring to earlier in terms of the impact that has. 
and you know that that manifests with having a poor or f a feeling that the, your your memory isn't as good as it was before. Perhaps doesn't surprise me. My instincts are, as with a lot of these, uh, the other post scad symptoms, be they chest pain or e anything else. My instinct is that they will improve gradually over time, and that because I think that that seems to be a very consistent thing that whatever the symptoms are, whatever those those issues are, post scad, and I you know think that there are a lot of them, and they they are quite varied dif between different people. But what is consistent is that they do seem to improve over time and that the overwhelming majority, not absolutely everybody, but the overwhelming majority of patients do feel that they get back to where they were before over time. But sometimes it does take time. Thank you.